something now we can safely come to the stage. Our uh, next presenter is going to be uh, Dr. Elizabeth Lieber, and she's going to be talking about the woodcutter in Iran. signal if you need me to speak louder. In 1965, the Persian poet Farsij Kalkali published the world's only epic poem about Abraham Lincoln. Written over the course of 15 years, the Woodcutter's epic comprises 14,000 lines of verse presented in 133 individual poems. It not only reflects upon and honors the historical 16th president of the United States and his emancipation of slaves in America during the Civil War, but it is also a critique of mid-20th century Iranian politics. Beneath the story of Lincoln lies a deep political subtext that speaks to contemporary interactions between East and West to the subversive and underhanded colonialism that great nations practice while outwardly proclaiming liberty, and to the continued need for liberators, perhaps not only in the Middle East, but also in the apparently democratic West. The work was no, uh, nominated for a Nobel Prize in 1967. Chancellor Saleh of the University of Tehran, who endorsed the nomination in a letter to the Swedish Academy, describes it as a masterpiece that represents the depths of philanthropic thoughts as well as meditations of Abraham Lincoln depicted in poetry by delicate emotions and the exceptional talent of an able poet. To lovers of peace and brotherhood, these lines clearly introduce the true emotions of the East, especially Iranians, who have contributed to the human culture, gem cutters like Hafez, Khayyam, Nizami, Saadi, Ferdowsi, and Malavi. Despite Saleh's assertion that the poem expresses the true emotions of Iranians, the poem itself eschews direct reference to Iran. It decries historical violations of human rights by Hitler and the pharaohs, the bloodlust of conquerors Attila, Nero, and Alexander, the rape of young girls in the harems of Baghdad, the sale of slaves at Dar al Raqqi, military appropriations of modern technology to spread terror and death, and even the arms race that threatens to carry, quote, madness to the moon to sow its dust with human nastiness, and in its unbounded ambition to blight planets as we have the earth by raising flags of war and discord there. But it seems to have nothing to say about recent events in Iran, including the 1953 coup that overthrew Prime Minister Mossadegh and cemented Anglo-American control of Iran's oil resources. Recently de declassified CIA documents relating to the coup underscore the extent to which America and Britain were involved. Threatened in its long-standing and lucrative monopoly by a bill presented by Mossadegh to Parliament on the 8th of March 1951 and ratified a week later to nationalize the oil industry, the Anglo-Iranian oil company engineered a coup that would ensure its own economic interests at the expense of Iranian sovereignty. The CIA and SIS worked through agents said to seed rebellion, mobilizing their Iranian assets, a term that included religious leaders, the press, street gangs, politicians, and other influential figures. They also engaged what uh, today might be termed fake news, distributing anti mossadic cartoons and broadsheets specifically designed to influence popular sentiment against the democratically elected prime minister. The result was the ousting of Mossadegh, the suppression of the nationalist movement, the ratification of the Shah's regime, the renegotiation of oil contracts in favor of Britain and America, and ultimately the 1978 revolution that finally and forcibly rejected Anglo-American control of Iranian resources through a puppet regime. I suggest that it is precisely Vasija's silence on contemporary events that makes his epic so powerful a commentary. 
by presenting a Lincoln who is less a historical person than an idea, a messianic symbol, Barsege was able to voice his responses to the coup, to the, American, uh, to the Anglo-American colonialist, colonialist machinations that precipitated it, and to the resulting political repression that quickly silenced the obviously dissident, including his own fledgling revolutionary newspaper, National Honor. So what I want to do in the next 15 minutes, and I'm aware I'm being timed, is explore briefly how Barsege creates First of all, how he creates this messianic Lincoln, and secondly, how he constructs for him an arc enemy that signals the poem's engagement with contemporary politics. So first of all, creating a messiah. Early in the epic, Basij argues that without divinely appointed guides, the human race would be irretrievably lost. Had not Messiah cleansed man's sin in blood, had not Muhammad walked his royal road, had not God's light glimmered in human hearts, had no good news descended from above, had not the hero broken slavery's chains, what would man's situation be like now? A path unlit by wisdom's flaming torch, a sheer drop tumbling into ignorance, and man himself more worthless than the dust. To rank Lincoln with Muhammad and Christ is a move of extraordinary boldness that verges, some might argue, on the blasphemous. However, in itself, it is insufficient to establish messianic status for Lincoln. Rather, that status accrues through a series of creative choices that construct what we might call a messianic platform, a literary framework that so powerfully elevates Lincoln that the reader, despite his or her rational resistance, is imaginatively persuaded. And there isn't time in this presentation to discuss the 10 elements that make up this messianic platform. Um, but if you're interested, there is an up upcoming uh, paper in uh, Lincoln Abroad, I think, next year. Bill, where is oh, yeah, right. um, But what I do want to mention is um, perhaps the strongest of these messianic themes, which is divine appointment. The following excerpt comes from a dream sequence narrated by a slave. He's watched Lincoln, in, in his dream, he's watched Lincoln pick up a picture of Jesus and pray. Then suddenly, that dark cavern was lit with radiant gold. No candle fed that blaze. And in its glory, Jesus' face appeared. The young man, that's Lincoln, cried out at the vision like a lost child gathered in its mother's arms or like a dead man who's recalled to life. On his shoulders, Jesus placed gentle hands and gazed into his tired, tender eyes. Go, he said. Loose men's feet from ignorance and calm the prisoner's cries that pierce my heart. The lover must be cleansed in his own blood if he would pray, must drive out selfishness if he would break these heavy chains, if he'd have peace and justice governing the world. Go, take your axe, cut through injustice roots. Were Barsege's purpose simply to record the life of the 16th President of the United States, such clearly fictive uh, episodes would be an embarrassment. A historical Lincoln need not be prophesied, divinely commissioned by God, and foredoomed to inevitable death. The value of the messianic platform is that it liberates Lincoln from the historical moment. It bestows upon him a significance parallel to that of Christ, unbound by time and place, so that he can offer retrospective hope to a long past world and proleptic redemption to a future world by modeling virtues essential to every individual and to every political system. Thus, the poems of the woodcutter take us from Congress as it passes laws endorsing slavery to ancient Egypt, where slaves toiled to build the pyramids. From the world's museums where the artifacts of oppression are displayed and admired to the beginnings of time, when heaven's hoary mingled freely with the peoples of the earth. How much time do I have? Their man loved violence. This is the, in the poem about the hoories. Their man loved violence and learned to love his sin. He spawned hostilities. Blacksmiths forged swords and spears. Warriors hauled these weapons into enemy chests. Um, so he's talking about increasing human violence. Um, the stars bewailed the death of human hope. 
Slowly the smoking sighs of tortured slaves swathed to the sky's bright roof. The stench of blood that reeked from corpses on the battlefield, the groans of wounded men that pierced the night, the cries of captives in their narrow cells, the ruckus of the victors' tipsy feasts, where those death dealers raised their heavy cups, tarnished the mirrors of the sky with rust and broke all interchange between the walls. But when the woodcutter signed freedom's deed, the sky's gates opened once again, again, Huri descended, gathering on earth to quaff the wine of peace. They carpeted the ground with flowers where he trod and strung, whoops, strung medallions of love about his neck and kissed those fingers sauce of miracles and combed the ill-kempt hair out of his eyes. Each Huri pressed her face against his cheek, murmuring mysteries into his ears, sharing the secret to immortality. Sit from God's cup, devote your blood, your life. While such episodes are utterly irrelevant to the story of the historical Lincoln, they're keenly relevant to the messianic Lincoln bar siege creates. Not only do they serve to contextualize pre-Civil War slavery as a violation of human rights as horrific as any in history, but they also establish a universal scope for Lincoln's mission. Like Christ before him, bar siege Lincoln redeems a fallen race, not just an enslaved people. So there's the Messiah. Let's look quickly at the enemy, colonialism. Of all the enemies this Lincoln faces, chief among them is colonialism, not slavery. Although slavery is a symptom and inevitable result of colonialism. While the historical Lincoln certainly faced the legacy of colonialism during his years in office, Bar Siege's Lincoln is warned about a timeless and universal, not a regional and temporary opponent. Um, and oh, I'm worried about the time. I'll try reading this. Colon he's told colonialism is your fiercest foe and not just yours. It's life's worst enemy. Its fists have beat and bruised the world. It seeks out traps and scatters bait. It votes against concord and unity. It plows the earth and in the sorrows sows discord and hate. Go where you will. It shadows you. Converse with friend or stranger. It will lean in close to overhear your words. It tracks your path like bandits following the caravan. The identification of colonialism as a ubiquitous enemy is elaborated in another poem from the, ep uh, from the epic simply called the atrocities of colonialism, where the activities of colonial power bear marked resemblance to those of the long despised Anglo-Iranian oil company and its American supporters in the 1953 coup. Colonialism, a careless corpse washer, an architect who draws but never builds, a slave trader who knows no other skill, a sage who builds utopia <coughs> on chains, a guest obsessed with robbery. He must steal something from his host before he sleeps. A charlatan who charms his audience until they follow him unthinkingly. A spider spinning webs to snare the world. A fiend who shovels graves without a pause. An agent sent to seed rebellion. A caravan grown rich on banditry. A raconteur who spreads superstitions to elevate man's wisdom, soul, and strength. Although the declassified CIA papers conclude, quote, to what extent the resulting activities stem from the specific efforts of all our agent agents will never be known, their records suggest in self-congratulatory tones that those agents played crucial roles at every step included swinging the security forces to the side of the demonstrators and ensuring the arrival of really large groups armed with sticks and stones from South Tehran. Spreading superstitions, of course, includes the kind of fake news created and circulated by the CIA. And any nationalist sympathizer in Iran would quickly identify the guest obsessed with robbery or the caravan grown rich on banditry with the Anglo-Iranian oil company. The woodcutter's epic never once mentions Iran, but its metamorphosis of the historical figure into a messianic symbol allows it to engage with contemporary political realities where open critique would fail. The poet, long fascinated by Lincoln, found in him a way to speak on behalf of his own people, circumventing the censorship of the Shah's reign. 
The messianic role, role he attributes to Lincoln, his restoration of human rights to all who suffer and long for deliverance, is keenly applicable to mid-century Iran, while the poem's representation, representation of what Soleil carefully calls the true emotions of the East, especially Iranians, includes the emotions of anger, betrayal, and despair at events that sabotaged their national autonomy. Thank you.